Welcome everybody, Simon Rosenberg here at Hopium Chronicles. This is our monthly gathering of our paid subscribers. Thank you all for helping uh, fund uh, this important work and spread Hopium all around the land. Um, your financial support makes all this possible. So thank you uh, so much for your help and for being here and for all that you do for not just me, but for Democrats in the country uh, writ large. Um, we are at the beginning of year two of Hopium, and as you know, you've gotten some messages from me about it, some thoughts and plans, which we can talk more about in the Q&A later. Um, but it's exciting. We've grown. You know, it's been, a, we're off to a great start in the first year. We're up to 60,000 subscribers. It's hard to believe. Uh, we're making some noise uh, as well, as you all can see in the last few weeks, and I'm just really pleased to be in this fight with all of you and excited to be uh, with all of you. Let me, what I'm going to do tonight is what I usually do, which is to let me tell you, I'm going to tell you, um, give you my thoughts on where things are, and then we'll have uh, some Q&A afterwards, and we'll go to the top of the hour. So I come back to this basic understanding of the election, which is that Joe Biden is a good president, the country's better off, um, the Democratic Party is strong, unified, raising lots of money and winning elections all across the country. And they have Trump, who is the ugliest political thing that all of us have ever seen. And that in every way, in every way imaginable, seven months out, I would much rather be us than them. So let's go through that, those three main points. Number one, Joe Biden's been a good president. I think it's indisputable that the country is far better off today than when Joe Biden came into office. If you all remember, right, he came into office in January 20th of 2021. The vaccines had not been distributed. COVID was raging across the country after having been mis badly mismanaged by the former president. Uh, the economy was in shambles. The global economy was teetering. We just had an insurrection and a cap an attack on our democracy. We had the first um, unpeaceful or uh, challenged the peaceful transfer of power in our history. The city itself that we that I live in was the capital was under military occupation essentially. Um, and, you know, things were deeply unsettled in America. And look how far we've come. I mean, we've, you know, got the strongest recovery of any G7 country. We have the lowest inflation of any G7 country, the economy. We have the best job market since the 1960s, the lowest uninsured rate in American history. Real wage growth is some of the fastest that we've seen in recent decades. Um, we know that inflation is too high, and I don't want to oversell what happened today. I mean, it was just a tiny bit above their expectations, and you know it could come back down next month. We can't get, we can't get overly freaked out about what happened in the inflation numbers today. And inflation is far better than it was, and it was all you know. This is all predicated on a global phenomenon um, that happened all around the world. Um, you know, the deficit is trillions of dollars less. We have you know a very elevated worker participation rates now in the United States of prime age workers. We have some of the uh, lowest, the most job openings per workers in, in modern times. And we also have the, the rap most significant and um, rap, what's the right word? We have the most, the largest new business formation. The most new businesses are being founded in, in many, many decades in the United States and many of them being founded by black and Hispanic entrepreneurs. And so, you know, the economy, we are in a far better place today. And I think that Joe Biden, on the fundamental promise that he made to us in 2020 that he was going to get us to the other side of COVID successfully, I think he's done that. I mean, we still have work to do. I'm not going to be Pollyannish about this, but we are in far better shape, I believe, than is the you know conventional wisdom out in the in the hinterlands. And what's important to recognize that I think something very significant has happened over the last few weeks, which is that the success of the Biden presidency has helped evaporate all of their main attacks against the president. You know, the economy is booming, it's not in recession. Inflation's down, it's not up. We have crime, it's not raging, it's actually murder rates and violent crime rates are down significantly all across the country. Um, there is no war on energy, which was the central argument they made against Biden, that he created inflation by creating this war on energy, which drove gas prices up. And yet we saw last year that we had the most renewables, gas, and, and oil ever produced in American history. And the United States in 2023 produced more oil than any country has ever produced in any one year in all the history of the world, right? Um, so if he was waging a war on energy, it was a pretty terrible one. Um, it, the border, which was an area of advantage for them, a second tier issue, by the way, for voters, but an area of advantage for Republicans, 
I think they've stumbled on that. And now we're the party that wants to bring order to the border and they want to, you know, maintain chaos. We saw, we litigated this in New York three, just with Tom Swazi, and we're able to come out on top in an actual live fire test of this kind of new environment post, I think, uh, Trump screwing this issue up. And then on the central issues about Biden himself, <clears throat> the first one being the Biden crime family story, we've learned that it was a Russian disinformation op that was once again laundered by willful Republicans in Congress. And then on his age, I think he did a lot to assuage people's concerns about his age of the State of the Union. We also learned that the her um, special counsel report that supposedly drew into question his age was actually fabricated and false. It was an extraordinary moment you know, in this, in this, um, that we have now special counsels lying and making stuff up about people in the other party during their special counsel investigations. And so it's my view that what's happening right now is that the, the election is moving from a referendum on Biden to a referendum on Trump. And that's not an election that they're going to win, given his historic awfulness. Number two, the Democratic Party is strong, unified, raising lots of money, um, and winning elections all across the country. And excuse me for a second. And they are um, historically, they are, as I called it today, they're a raging dumpster fire as a political party. You know, all of you know that we've been winning elections. Um, I'm just going to text my family to see if somebody can go make my dog happy. I don't know if you guys can hear him, but he's on a... Katie, thank you. Um, you got to take uh, care of the dog. <laughs> so uh, I can hear him. I can hear him. Uh, my dog can bark for an hour without stopping. He's a special, very special part of our family. Um, so number two, the party, right? We, as all of you know, and I won't go through this all again because I've done it so many times, but since Dobbs, you know, we did some, we did uh, in 2018 and 2020, we defeated MAGA, right? We took away the House, the Senate, the presidency. Defeating an incumbent president is never easy. We won that election by four and a half points. Yes, it was close in the battlegrounds. But then something happened, I think, in these last few years that's even more miraculous than what we did in 2018 and 2020, which is that we, the party in power, always loses seats and power ebbs and flows, I mean, flows away from the party in power to the other party. And that hasn't happened. I mean, we picked up a Senate seat in 2022. We picked up uh, two governorships net. We picked up four state legislative chambers in 2022. We gain ground in the battleground in Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, Minnesota, Michigan, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania. We got all the way up to 59% in Colorado, 57% in Pennsylvania, 55 in um, Michigan, 54 in New Hampshire. And, in, and what's important is that those results would have been really good results in a, a good year. And this was a, a so-called bad year, a red wave year, a year of high inflation, low Biden approval. It was an extraordinary performance. In 2023, we did you know, even better. It was a blue wave year all across the country in 2023. And then in early 2024, we're seeing the same basic dynamic of Biden overperforming, the Democrats overperforming expectations, raising lots of money, strong grassroots, and Republicans struggling. And if you remember, we were all told that New York 3 was a big bellwether that was going to tell us a lot about this election. And you know, the polls had us up two or three points, and we won by eight points in a district that, that we had <clears throat> lost just 16 months earlier by seven and a half points. And so you conti you've continued to see this basic dynamic of us being strong and overperforming and Republicans struggling. And we now know the fundraising numbers, right? The numbers we're raising, we have, and this last filing, we have a hundred million dollars more than Trump does on the Republican side. We're also raising money at a more rapid rate. So our the, the, the advantage we have is growing, right? Don't believe that he raised $50 million the other night. There's not, a, there's not any reason whatsoever to believe any of those numbers, right? It's ridiculous that the media was even buying into any of this. They're struggling to raise money. They're cash poor. They've laid off staff. They're not building staff. Their party is in a sh is in sham. You know, our party is also very unified. And you just saw in the last few weeks that uh, Biden's done events now with Clinton and Obama and Bernie Sanders. And there was no significant opposition to Biden in the primary whatsoever. There was an opportunity to go challenge him. And the two guys that did, RFK and Dean Phillips, really flamed out. And RFK has had to leave the Democratic Party. He was being so he was failing so poorly. He was doing so poorly against Biden. So the party, in my view, is strong. We're winning elections, raising tons of money. We're building a really strong campaign. 
Um, and, uh, and it's very unified, historically unified, I think, as we head into the general election. They are a raging dumpster fire, right? They're not raising any money. They've got enormous hard dollar problems. The RNC is in turmoil. Their campaign is two, three, four, five months behind us without enough time to make up ground, right? They've had, we've had record retirements coming out of the House. <clears throat> and Republicans are not just retiring from the House, they're quitting and giving two weeks notice which is unprecedented in all the time that I've been here, the more than 30 years I've been here. Um, what else? What are my other stories about, <clears throat> about their party? Just Their party's a mess. Their whole thing's a mess. Oh, and then he has unprecedented opposition inside his own party. People like Mitt Romney and Liz Cheney. We've never seen the kind of open rebellion against the nominee that there is right now in the Republican Party. And that splintering was evident in the 2022 election. Those MAGA candidates that ran in 2022 were unable to bring their party back together. The non-MAGA part of the Republican Party just didn't go along with MAGA. And that's the likely scenario in this election. The likely scenario is that we stay unified. You know, And what I've been saying, to be clear, if you read my writing, I even said it in an MSNBC op-ed back in December, that the likely scenario is that as the campaign turned on and we got deeper into the general election and people started paying attention, that Biden's poll numbers would go up. And that's exactly what's happened. I mean, we've gone up a point, two, three, somewhere in there in the last, you know, since the state of the, and it actually began before the state of the union, by the way, the movement towards Biden. <clears throat> and now, you know, Biden is ahead in the last few weeks in more polls than Trump is. Um, we are, you know, we got three more polls today showing Biden ahead. He's now showing, he's now ahead by plus three, plus four in some of these polls. Many of the polls that Trump has led in are Republican funded polls. And particularly the Wall Street Journal poll, which freaked everybody out last week. I just want to remind everybody that poll was paid for by Rupert Murdoch and the pollster was Trump's own pollster. There's just simply no reason for us to have taken that poll seriously at this point in the election. And we know that Republicans have played games with polling. It's what happened in 2022. So I feel like things are getting better. We've also had polls in the last few weeks showing Biden ahead in Michigan, ahead in Wisconsin, ahead in uh, Pennsylvania. Our Senate candidates are doing really well all across the country. There's not a single Senate candidate of, that matters to us that's struggling or behind right now. And then finally um, on polling, you know, we just got a poll today, came at just an hour, came out an hour or two ago in North Carolina by Quinnipiac, a, strong, a large sample poll showing um, Josh Stein up eight points over Mark Robinson and us only down two in North Carolina, which is within margin of error. It's the second poll taken in the last two weeks in North Carolina showing the race within margin of error. And we know that Arizona in all likelihood got much tougher for the Republicans in the last few days. The Biden campaign is also now staffing up in, in Florida. We're gonna see how much, how real that becomes. But I think as we, if you watched the interview I did with Ann Hockhammer today, you know, I'm not giving up on Florida. I think it's something we have to pay attention to. There's an extraordinary constellation of things that are happening there that could make Florida at least on the outer end of what, you know, possible if we have a really good election. And I don't think we should, as you all know, my whole theory of this cycle is about growth and expansion and taking stuff away from them. So when I look at all the recent polling, you know, I'm encouraged. And because this is exactly what us and the campaign and many people thought was going to happen, which is that once people start engaging, um, you know, the awfulness of Trump and the success of the Biden presidency was going to become clearer. The contrast was going to become clearer. And I think that's part of what we've seen um, uh, in, in recent weeks. And then finally, Trump, right? We all know uh, that, you know, I, I described him as the, I, my new, new term is the ugliest political thing that we've all ever seen. And that may be actually uh, modest in, in the way that we're <laughs> describing him. I mean, he is, you know, let's just go through it, right? His performance on the stump is far more degraded, impulsive, and erratic and disturbing than it was for you. I mean, he's a much weaker candidate, in my view, than he was in 2016 and 2020. I also think that there's no real comparison that we can make between 2024 and 2016 and 2020, because I think everything changed after Dobbs. And I think these efforts to try to talk about this election like other elections is a waste of time. It's 2024, it's not 2016, it's not 2020. It's got its own unique dynamics. And I think that part of it is that we're in this post Dobbs era where Republicans have continually struggled. Because I do think that, that something broke inside the Republican party with Dobbs. That they, that a big chunk of the Republican party, 15, 20, 25% was like, this is too much, we've gone too far. And they became loosened from the Republican party. 
I'm not saying they're going to vote for us. I'm not saying they're going to stay home, but that the relationship between the MAGA part of the Republican Party and the non-MAGA part has been loosened and attenuated in, in recent years. And it's a huge challenge for them and, and you know, in this election. Um, and I think that Trump's performance is, is, um, is severely degraded. Um, I also think that you know, he's campaigning from the courthouse and not the White House. And I think that you can't underestimate how significant that is over time. He doesn't have the White House as a backdrop. He has no ability to generate positive news. The, the news coming out about him all, every day all, is just relentlessly negative and down. Um, and I think that, you know, in my own view, I don't know what's going to happen in any of these trials. It's very possible he doesn't get convicted in any of them. But I don't know that it really matters politically. It may matter legally, but politically, there are six things that voters are going to find out about Donald Trump in the next few months that they didn't know about him in 2020 that I think are going to be consequential. Number one, that he raped E. Jean Carroll in a department store dressing room. Number two, that he oversaw one of the largest financial frauds in American history. And his family has been, he and his kids have now been banned from doing business in New York. Three, that he uh, stole America's secrets, lied to the FBI about it, shared those secrets with other people in what may be the largest security breach in the history of the United States. Fourth, that he led an insurrection against the United States, an attack, he led an attack, an armed attack on the Capitol on one of the only days that all 435 members are there all at the same time. And he's promised to end American democracy for all time if he actually gets into the White House in January of 25. Fifth, that he and his family have corruptly taken more money from foreign governments than any family in American, any political family in American history. And sixth, that he's singularly responsible for ending Roe. And I don't know how he survives any one of those six, He's going to have to survive all of them. And I just don't think that he has the standing with the public, the political skills, the campaign apparatus underneath him, right, to be able to withstand what's about to happen to him. And you're already starting to see erosion in him. I mean, it's not just that we're going up, is that I think you're starting to see erosion in with Trump. And so when I put all this together, right, I am optimistic. I'm not Pollyannish. I'm not predicting. There's no predicting. I don't predict the future. This has been... The story of the New York Times, I think, was a little bit um, not accurate about what I do. What I do is I tell you what I think is what is the likely scenario in this election. That's what I did in 2022. Obviously, things are going to change, right? Elections change all the time. In 2016, the polls weren't wrong, but the election changed at the end. I mean, this stuff can happen. Um, you know, Comey changed the election in the last 10 days. Hillary was cruising to victory um, until Comey intervened in the election 10 days out. And so, you know, things are going to change. We already have these inflation numbers today, right? That's changed, right? We're getting changes. Trump may get convicted of a crime in the next 30 days. That's going to change things, right? But when you look at all the things that are happening and the general trajectory of things, I would much rather be us than, than them. And I feel really good about where we are. I also, one of the couple like intangibles, right, that I will just put out there is that I think the Biden campaign it's often the case that re-election campaigns are very conservative because they're because the command and control structure is complicated because it has to not just go through the campaign, but also through the White House, too. And the White House and the campaign are you know, far away from each other. And sometimes decision making gets a little sclerotic in a, in a re-election campaign. I don't think that's happening with this campaign. I think they're I think they're being given, particularly the communications operation, the digital communications operations, being given a very long leash. And and Biden is really playing along, and they're getting the most out of Biden. I think we could possibly get in the digital front. And I've been really impressed as, with the aggressiveness of the digital team, the speed in which they're operating, the ambition that they have. They're taking risks, right? They're charting kind of new ground in the videos they're doing. This has been really important because it is, um, it's how we're going to reach young people, right? I mean, we have to be able to show up digitally through, you know, um, organic, um, you know, content where that we not just ads, but organically created content that can be shared through social networks. You know, we're creating a fair amount of this pretty early in the campaign. And it's also competent and good and strong in addition to the TV ads that I'm constantly sharing with you. This stuff's a little bit harder to share because they also post, you know, 15, 20 times a day, 30 times a day, but it's called Biden Harris HQ. And if whatever social media platform you're on, you should be subscribing to it. I think you will feel that they're bringing it and they're hustling and that, you know, they're trying really hard and are punching 
they're punching Trump hard in this in their in their work. And I've been really impressed with how, you know, every election cycle, when you run for president, you have to reinvent a campaign. There's new tactics, new strategies, new tools, like all the grassroots stuff that we're all involved in. This is all kind of new stuff. Um, and the digital piece of this campaign is very successful, very early, very innovative, powerful. And it's been really encouraging to me because somebody made a decision to let these guys go and trust them. And it's this guy, Rob Flaherty, who I should probably have on here and bring and talk to all of you so he can talk about what they're doing. So I feel good. And I'm also just really proud that Hopium's growing. I'm glad that our community is growing. I'm proud of all the money we've been raising, right? I mean, we uh, have raised for Anderson Clayton close to $170,000 of early money, really critical in helping give her the tools to be successful. We've raised over $120,000 now for Ruben Gallego and he texted me and thanked me. And you saw that Anderson actually came on to our community and thanked us a few weeks ago, right? And then we've raised a lot of money for Joe Biden. We've sent thousands and thousands of people in there. And I will be announcing soon some additional recommendations of things that people can do. I'm a little behind where I was. It, it was a little bit more complicated than I thought it was going to be, to be honest. And because um, I want to only recommend things to you that I'm really going to get behind. I don't want to give you a big, long list. I'm going to give you a small, concentrated list. I'm still very happy that we played such a leading role in Arizona. I, Arizona to me is North Carolina and Arizona. I'm very comfortable that those are the two states that we've made our biggest investments in so far. I'm really proud of that. Um, I think it's the right place for us to have gone and we need to continue to work there um, in both of those states. And, um, and then that's it. Let me, let me get to questions, but anyway, thanks everybody. I mean, I'm really, A, I think we're making a difference and B, I'm having a lot of fun and I'm really just grateful for all of you to have, because of your financial support, it, this is all you've made, you've helped make this all possible. Um, let me address the, the two questions that I know are going to come up right away. <laughs> and so let me just get to those, um, RFK and Israel Gaza. Um, so RFK, uh, some, some of you have, and, and by the way, I'm only going to take written questions because, um, and so if you have questions, put them in the chat and I'll be diving in there um, for everybody. So RFK, as many of you have heard, I have argued now for months that the most significant rogue party, third party, splinter party movement in America is the never Trumpers and they're aligned with us and they may become very significant in this election. I mean, if Mitt Romney and Liz Cheney and Adam Kissinger and others campaign with Joe Biden in the final couple of months of the election, it will be an unprecedented coming together of two American political parties and leaders of two American political parties to defend democracy. I think this is possible. I think we have work to do. The campaign in the Biden world has work to do to create as much comfort for these Republicans to come into our coalition. Um, but I feel like this is the most significant of the efforts that are underway that could be that has already been consequential and could be again in this election cycle. So, second is, you know, look, no labels is gone, everybody. I mean, congratulations. I mean, I can't tell you how many presentations that I've given in the last year where the 87 questions about the freak out about no labels, right? It's gone. Congratulations, everybody, right? Golf clap for all of us. Um, and for the particularly for the people that fought hard against no labels, um, you know, one of the threats to Biden is now gone. Now it's RFK. And let's just be very clear, everybody. RFK is a ludicrous, ridiculous political figure, you know, sort of the a, a example of how far we've, you know, that the Republican Party and greater MAGA have fallen. I'm just going to say a couple of things about RFK because I'm going to be starting to engage him more frontally and the campaign has been engaging him already because we have to engage him, we have to degrade him, right? We have to take him seriously and take him down. There are two things that I would say about him that stand out to me, or three things. One is his performance when he speaks is comical and it's impossible to take him seriously when you listen to him talk. He lies incredibly, he gets called out on lying. It's unbelievable how many television appearances he's been on where they roll tape and show that he's just bald faced lying. I've never seen anything like this other than Trump because they've never done it to Trump directly. Robert Kennedy has been confronted by people in the media for his lying more directly than any politician that I've ever seen. And we're only in the beginning of this whole thing. He's a ridiculous figure and we shouldn't be scared by him, right? Second is that, 
you know, his anti-vax stuff and his um, his suspicion of public health and healthcare is a huge problem for him. And because it is, it's lunacy. And remember, he's, he was an appointed official in the Trump administration. He was appointed to an, a VAX board. He was part, you know, Trump appointed him. He took an appointment from Donald Trump. His whole campaign is being run. His super PAC is all Republican political operatives. His money is coming from Trump's biggest supporters. I mean, what, what? And so the whole thing about Kennedy is that it's a fraud, right? This is a, a greater MAGA project. It's just so naked and obvious. We saw that video this week that I showed on our site. And it's and the, we're going to work very hard to make sure the media doesn't take this can play this campaign straight. It's a fraudulent campaign. It's being funded and created by MAGA. And, and it's not a presidential campaign, right? I don't know what it is. We have to figure out some other way of talking about it. But it's an insult to us as a country that we have to look at this and pretend like this is a real thing and this is a serious candidate when it's just another way to go after Biden. It's an, an illicit way to go after Biden, right? Third is that one of the things I'm going to be writing about in the next few days is I think Robert Kennedy is an agent of the Russian government. And I'm just going to say it right now. When you go look at the things that he has been saying in the last 10 days, it is as if these talking points are literally written in Moscow and given to him. And there are two concrete examples of this. The email that he sent out on Friday that got so much attention, he said that he equated um, the civil rights abuses of Snowden, uh, Julian Assange, and the January 6th folks. Right? Let's just unpack that for a second. Uh, Snowden is one of the greatest traitors in American history. He lives in Moscow. He was part of a Russian operation to steal secrets in the United States. He's, you know, an ally of Vladimir Putin and the Russian government. Two, Julian Assange. Julian Assange's organization was a cutout for Russian, Russian intelligence that helped throw the election of Donald Trump in 2016. And three, um, the January 6th, those people attacked the Capitol and tried to overthrow the American government, right? In what universe are these sympathetic figures? In what universe could an American politician and patriot view these people as people that are that we are defending and aligning with, right? It's like the only possible way that you would come up with those three things is if you were sitting in Moscow, right? Because the first two are direct allies of Vladimir Putin, right? And have, have been detrimental to our democracy and to the, and the security of the United States. And the third group attacked the United States itself, right? Who looks at them with admiration? The second thing is that he, in an interview he gave last week, he used the most rancid um, language to describe what was happening in Ukraine that included that he believed that Putin went in to denazify um, you know, Ukraine, which is an absurd Putin construction that is an absurdity on every possible level. And nobody... In even in MAGA world, nobody talks like that. The only people that use the term denazification is Putin. The only person in the whole world that uses that language is Vladimir Putin and Robert Kennedy, right? Last week in an on-camera interview, we have the video. I don't know how one of the stories of our time is going to be about how Russia penetrated the Republican Party and other political leaders in the United States. It's something that we have to have a more honest and overt conversation around. It's something I've worked on quite a bit and I don't talk about it very much at Hopium, but it's gonna become more of a part of our, of our discussion about what's happening and the threat to the United States. And then finally, Israel-Gaza. There's no evidence that this is having a major impact on Joe Biden and we have to not, it doesn't mean it can't, it doesn't mean that it won't, but it isn't right now. There just isn't any data to support this. There is no big fissure in the Democratic Party. His poll numbers are going up, right? The Democratic Party's congressional generic numbers are going up. His numbers in all the, in the many of the battleground states are improving, right? There's no drag on him. He's actually going up, right? We are ahead in Michigan, for example, in the latest poll in Michigan by three points. We've been tied in Michigan and within margin of error. We're actually doing better in Michigan in public polling than virtually any other state in the country that's competitive right now. And then third, I just went to the Economist YouGov poll, and which is a great weekly track that comes out on Wednesdays. So this is a very fresh data. Among 18 to 29 year olds, their most important issue, um, foreign policy was 2%. And here are the issues that polled higher than foreign policy in this poll for 18 to 29 year olds. 
inflation, healthcare, jobs in the economy, climate, abortion, education, uh, and immigration, and uh, civil rights. Right? It's at the very bottom. And so this idea that, you know, and I think for those of us in the business who've been doing this a long time, the idea that a marginal 25-year-old would be voting on Israel Gaza in October, given all these other issues, was always absurd, actually, right? I mean, it doesn't mean that there isn't a passionate group of Democrats that view this issue as their central issue. We understand that, right? That's We understand that. But it's an incredibly small universe of people. And we have to stop pretending that this is some kind of huge organized you know, threat, or I, I, the way I describe it is that Israel Gaza is a challenge to Joe Biden. It's not a threat. What's happening with Donald Trump and the rebellion in the Republican Party against him is an existential threat to his candidacy. This is like in every campaign and every broad coalition that you build, you've got coalition management issues. But imagine that the way that you run a presidential campaign is that any group of 40 or 50,000 people could have veto power over the rest of the agenda of, of a campaign. It's an absurdity. And so we have to stop. What I've talked about is that we need to pull apart the politics of Israel Gaza from the policy. We can have a policy discussion and a policy debate, and we should. You know, we don't have to agree on everything. I don't agree with folks in our in our party about this issue, right? Um, I haven't always agreed with Joe Biden, right? But we still have a policy debate. But this notion that this is going to cost us the election, it's just bullshit. And it has gone on too long. I'm going to start fighting this a little bit more aggressively. And we've even had, frankly, inside the Hopium community over the last couple of days, somebody who's been spreading what I feel is could, could be completely false information about this. And I've been challenging it because I don't let false information live outside. And I'm not going to let it live inside our community either. And the people who are critics of Joe Biden on this are disrespectful to the president. And they're disrespectful to us because they're often presenting information that is not true to us about what's actually happening on the politics of all of this. And so, you know, I'm not threatened. I think, look, this is a challenge. Iran may strike Israel in the next few days. This is going to be, you know, a major challenge for us going forward. Um, but I stand by my president on this. I think this has been a very tough challenge. And, and, I, and I'm not in a place where I feel that this is in any way a serious threat to his campaign and to our coalition. It could be right? Many things could happen. A meteor could hit the earth tomorrow, right? But it isn't today. Okay, let me get to your, your written questions. Um, in the, I'm going to go to the Q&A, and I also know there's been a lot in the chat. Um, yeah, Donna asked about, yeah, look, the, the Biden campaign and the DNC are talking about Kennedy all the time, producing content against him all the time. Um, there is a, a super PAC being created that's going to specifically um, educate voters about Kennedy. I don't, we don't yet know what that means, right? We don't understand yet about whether they're going to be doing ads. I mean, this is still in the, in the early stages. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're taking this really seriously. And, and, and I think that, um, you know, we also, in, you know, as you often hear me talk, it's my view that we should be spending two thirds of our time spreading positive information about Joe Biden, and the Democrats, and then one third of our time indicting and going after them, them, that one third of our time going after them and degrading them and informing our communities about them, now some of that time has to be Kennedy time. But I will tell you, having done this for a long time, Kennedy is so is such a ridiculous figure that I don't think this, I, look, our opponent in this election is Donald Trump. And that is where we have to spend most of our time. I, I'm not convinced that Kennedy is going to rise up to be something of great significance. I mean, we have to degrade him and engage him, but I also, we cannot get spooked by him either, right? Like we're very capable of giving, our family is very capable of giving our opposition power that they don't actually have or that they haven't earned themselves. And we have to be really careful. Let's let Robert Kennedy and his goofy vice president candidate, you know, go out and make their case. I think every time he speaks, he loses voters, you know? And, and so, I think this is again, I look, I my basic take on where we are right now is that all the things that we need to do to win are within our power to do and are within traditional political bounds that can be achieved. It doesn't mean we will, right? I mean, in if you use the NCAA double A, you know, NCAA tournament, the higher seed team doesn't always win, right? But we're the higher seed team here, in my view. And they're the lower seed. And we should win this election. 
because the things that we have to do are within our power to do what they have to do, which is to make that guy look like a serious presidential candidate again. I don't think that that's within their power to do. I don't think he's, I don't think he can be dressed up. I mean, you saw what I said to, you know, that he wears more makeup than a drag queen. I mean, he, he is his perform, you know, they're not, they're basically, he's not campaigning anymore. Right. Like some of the guy campaigning from the basement this time is Trump because they can't let him out because every time he goes out and speaks, he says crazy stuff that causes enormous harm to the campaign. And so, you know, they've got this guy is he's a terrible candidate. And, you know, we can't we have to work hard with our friends and our communities to treat this like the emperor has no clothes. Right. You know, we have to start saying the emperor has no clothes <laughs> and, you know, he doesn't have any clothes. The orange, the orange emperor doesn't have any clothes, everybody. Right. Like we're pulling the wizard, the curtain back from the wizard, whatever the analogy is. You know, this guy, and I feel like the media is starting to shift. If you've watched my TV appearances that I've been sharing with you, and I have more uh, coming up, you can feel the media shifting a little bit in, in recognizing. And I think what's happened in Washington and the elite world here is their fundraising problems that they've had has really been kind of a major issue in the internal way that political people here assess the health of his candidacy. I think it's been shocking to people here how, how much struggle how much trouble they've had raising money his underperformance you know i showed that axios piece which documented his underperformance in the you know in polling and in the early states the opposition to him um, these are all things we've been talking about here for months but now they're being openly talked about in ways they weren't in the media a few weeks ago a few months ago and there is this sort of creeping sense that maybe this guy is actually a big you know, is, is, you know, is not a serious candidate to use a, a euphemism. Um, I will say, by the way, for those of you, I'm starting to do more in-person travel and more in-person events. This is a new part of Hopium. I'm still struggling my way through it, frankly, a little bit. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than I thought it was going to be. And so, for example, I'm in Arizona next week, but I'm also going to be in Arlington, Virginia, doing a fundraiser for the Arlington County Democratic Party on Saturday night, for those of you in the DC region, if you wanna come and hang out, I'm going to Wisconsin in June. I'm now also gonna to go to Minnesota. I'm coming to Minnesota. I spoke to Ken Martin, the, D the state party chair in Minnesota. I'm gonna to try to do more of these events. And so I can start seeing more of you in, in person um, as I travel around the country. And I still have to work that out. Um, let me just look at other questions here. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the Senate races, I, I want to just remind everybody, right, that there is no bad polling for us in any Senate race. It doesn't mean there won't be. It doesn't mean that we won't start seeing one of our candidates drop behind, but all the polling in Pennsylvania looks good. You know, Tester is whole, te I think there's a general view that Tester and Brown are much more likely to win those races than lose them, right, because they're both unique and powerful candidates, very well suited to their states. I think Arizona, we're where we were already ahead and the polling has gotten better. Um, I think Pennsylvania, all the early polling there shows that we're in very good shape in Pennsylvania. Um, Alyssa Slotkin is up, you know, three, four points uh, in Michigan. I think that's a race we may have to start paying a little bit more attention to. I still think, we're, I just want to be clear. I think we're going to win Michigan by four or five, six points in this election. Um, I don't think it's going to be close. I, and it hasn't been close recently. And, um, and I think the, one of the things that we don't talk enough about here is that the amount of money unions are spending uh, in this election communicating about Biden to working class folks is unprecedented because Biden has more authentic and legitimate and enthusiastic union support than any Democratic presidential candidates had in many, many decades. And we're already starting to see them spend lots of money communicating to their communities using very sophisticated media I've shared some of it on the Hopium site over the last few weeks. Um, we've never had that before. And, and I think, you know, I think that the family is very, is going to be very forward leaning and spending a lot of money. And so in Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, we have, we've, you know, we have assets there we haven't had in, in recent years. And I will say, I meant to say this in the polling conversation. The other thing that's happened in the last few days, and I don't put a lot of stock in this, I don't really follow the predicted markets and the betting markets. But Biden's got it, gotten ahead of Trump 
in the predicted markets and the and the betting markets. And there are people that pay a lot of attention to that. It's often people that do risk analysis for countries or for businesses. And I've had several different firms reach out to me in the last two days who asked me to do presentations because they've seen these things flip in the last few days to Biden. And all of a sudden, all these the advice that they give to all their clients or they give inside their government that Trump was leading, there's now a lot of data showing that Trump is not leading anymore. And I am telling you, this stuff is starting to bleed into this you know, global conversation about where we are in, in the election. And, and it's not just Simon, you know, spitballing here. I mean, there is a general, there is now a fair amount of data. And one of the things I like today is there's this thing called Polymarket, which is one of these betting sites. They had Biden, the likelihood of Biden winning in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin up in the high 50s, each of them. And, you know, we win the election if we win those three states, right? And so, you know, they, so it essentially all these betting markets right now and all these predicted markets have, have Biden winning the election. And that was not true a week ago, right? I mean, I just want everyone to understand the vibe shift that's going on here. If you watch the interview in Hopium today that I did with Caitlin Collins, you know, you saw how open she was, right, to the argument I was making. You know, you saw it, you know, Lawrence is always open to it. But I also went on Nicole Wallace last week. I'd never been on, I've never met her. I had not been on her show before. She was wildly open to the argument I was making. I went on John Berman at CNN, right? He was open and it was a little bit of a funny conversation, but I'm going on Aaron Burnett. I mean, I, I'm always hesitant to tell you when I'm going on a show because inevitably I get canceled and then people are like, where were you, right? But right now in the next five days, I mean, I'm scheduled on Aaron Burnett tomorrow night in the seven o'clock hour, Stephanie Rule in the 11 o'clock hour. I'm possibly going to be on MSNBC on Friday night. I'm going back on Caitlin Collins' show on Monday and I'm likely to be on Lawrence O'Donnell's show on Tuesday, right? And so there's a lot of interest in the argument I'm making because I think people feel the election changing and I have an explanation for it, right? I can explain what I think is happening. And it's been, yeah, yay is right, right? Like, this is good, everybody. This is like an unalloyed good that I'm getting to spread hopium to more and more folks uh, in the country. Um, I want to I wanna just say that because it's come up several questions, Hispanics, like I, I'm, I am not in the doom and gloom camp on the Democratic coalition, right? Um, you have to start with this basic understanding that we've been winning elections like crazy everywhere all across the country <laughs> for the last couple of years when we weren't supposed to be, right? So when people have had to go vote, right? Like we've done better than, and Republicans have done worse. And if you go look at what happened with Trump, Trump underperformed all of his public polling this whole idea that Trump overperforms polls, right? This is like these urban legends that sort of bleed on, these zombie ideas, right, that lead on. Because on things like Trump overperforms polls or the battleground is always three to four points more Republican, right? Those were true before. There's no reason they're going to be true this time. They might be, but there's, you know, it's, there's no ironclad. In fact, in the battleground states in 2022, we did better than public polling, right? So the exact opposite. Right. The battleground was actually better for us than the national vote. And we just have, have we have to have humility. Right. Every election's brand new and there's no no elections like any other. They're all sui generis. They all have their own dynamics. And what happens is people make mistakes. They, they get lazy and they say, well, this is like this. Well, nothing is like this. There is no 2024 is not like any other election. It's like 2024. And, you know, I don't know that the battlegrounds are going to be three to four points more Republican. They may be, they may not be, right? I mean, Nate Cohn has actually argued that they're going to be, there isn't going to be a big um, difference this time. And so this idea now that we're hearing, well, Biden may be up in the popular vote, but he's losing in the states. We don't have enough data to make that conclusion. I think it's an absurdity, right? And in fact, as I said, we're actually up in polling in a bunch of the battlegrounds right now. Um, and so the North Carolina poll today was unbelievably encouraging everybody. Like, I think we're going to win North Carolina. Remember, Mark Robinson is such an extremist. I mean, he's more extreme than Trump in many ways. The guy who's the gubernatorial nominee in North Carolina. If he's down eight points or even six points, Biden will catch up with Josh Stein, right? That's going to happen in Pennsylvania too. It's going to happen in Arizona, right? I mean, if our Senate candidates are up in the low 50s, Biden's going to get there. It's not going to go the other way, right? And there isn't going to be four to six percent of the electorate that votes, you know, for um, Bob Casey and then votes for Trump. That's not going to happen. 
And so these, the strength of our Senate polling is really, really important as kind of a benchmark about where the Democrat Republican thing is in, in those states. And so let me, let me just say that um, there's no question Biden's at 42%, 43%, 44%. He got 51% last time. Some of our coalition is wandering, right? There's no question about that. My view is, and what I've been saying for many months, is that a big chunk of that coalition would come home once the election started and the campaign turned on and it was time for people to start paying attention. Um, but then we have a campaign to go get the rest. And you know, I'm still very skeptical that the most xenophobic, racist, nativist, bigoted, anti-Semitic political leader in modern times is the guy that is seeing gains with minority voters. I'm, I'm approaching this as somebody who's worked in the Hispanic vote for a very long time. I'm approaching this with enormous skepticism. It doesn't mean it's not, you know, and I'm also skeptical of polling as well about this stuff. I want to see what happens in actual elections, right? I want to see what ha I, this, we could have um, real structural problems with young black men and young Hispanic men, but I don't know. Let's see, right? Um, because I think what did happen is that during COVID, I think that Trump, that Biden won the election because he appealed, he argued he was going to get us to the other side of COVID, which he's done successfully. But there were, I think for young Black men and young Hispanic men, there's been enormous disruption in recent years in their lives, right? Economic lives. You know, COVID was wildly disruptive to young people. And if you were also people out of school age and for, you know, supporting your family, I mean, this was a very difficult period. And, and I think that part of the legacy of what we're dealing with or sort of the late the latent was the argument that Trump made that we were shut down Democrats. And I think that shut down Democrat argument had an impact. It didn't help them win the election, but it created distance from for us with a core part of our constituency, young black and Hispanic men, that I think is fixable, right? Like I don't think this is, and, and this idea that there's some kind of racial realignment happening I just want to, I'm going to be a skeptic until election day about this, right? Because Trump is, is an, is a rancid racist. He is, you know, he's done more to insult Hispanics than any modern politician. Like, I just don't believe that this guy is going to be the guy that creates a breakthrough for the Republicans with, with minority voters. I just don't believe it. And, and we'll see, right? I mean, we're going to be coming back to this right again and again. Um, and so uh, the, and remember, I mean, I have a whole presentation of the Hispanic vote that I have to update, but I want everyone to remember one thing about the Hispanic vote. In 2004, when Bush got 50, 44%, the best a Republican had done in recent, in the last two generations, our net margin of Hispanic votes in America was 700,000 votes. We got 700,000 more Hispanic votes than Republicans. In 2020, it was 5 million, right? So because the population's grown so much, even if we get a slightly smaller share, we actually gain votes, right? If you understand the math of that. So it's in 2020, we've done better in the Southwest. So in 2004, the last time Republicans won the popular vote and won the Electoral College, and they've only done that once, right? Since 1988, um, 2004, there have been six states that flipped from Bush to us, and it's Virginia and Georgia, in the, and, and then we're going to add North Carolina to that, right? Uh, and it's the four southwestern states, Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico. In 2004, Bush won all four of those states. Republicans controlled five of the eight Senate seats in those four states, and they controlled 14 out of the 21 House seats in those states. Today, Joe Biden won those four states, the first Democrat to win all four of them since FDR in 1940. We control, the Republicans have no Senate seats down from five in those four states. And we control 14 of the 23 House seats. The success we've had in bluing the Southwest is the single most successful political project of the Democratic Party in the last 25 years. And, and it's happened because of the Hispanic vote. Our success with Hispanics has been the most successful, in my view, party-wide project that we've had in the last 25 years. And we wouldn't have the majority we had in the House and Senate, you know, over the last few years without this blueing of the Southwest. We wouldn't have the Electoral College majority that we have, right? 
you know, this has been deeply consequential. And, um, and so our story about Hispanics is we're gaining, it's the Republican party that's eroding the Hispanics, it's not us. As you can see what's happened in California and the Southwest and whether or not, you know, Colin Alred can make Texas competitive. And I'm still open. I'm still open to the idea that Florida and Texas can be competitive. We shouldn't, you know, shut the door. But I'm not jumping into those races yet. And we have to see a little bit more information and data before, you know, I would recommend them. I do think one of the things, if you're thinking about Arizona and Florida right now, and one of the reasons I had Anna on today is that I do think that the Florida ballot initiative may be something that Hopium gets behind because if we win that ballot initiative, it will utterly transform Florida politics in a way that may be our biggest opportunity this cycle, you know, to break the back of, of MAGA in Florida. Um, you know, not the Republican Party, because they're going to be Republicans aligned work. You know, Anna's group is bipartisan, the group she leads. But it's about breaking the, you know, I, I had dinner with some Hopia members last night, and we talked about how you can love the sin, love the sinner, but hate the sin. You know, we have to stay focused on weakening MAGA. MAGA is the problem, not the Republican Party. MAGA is the problem. MAGA is the threat. And, um, you know, we can do a lot of good for an important state by helping that ballot initiative pass, which it can. You know, it can pass. It's going to be a titanic battle. But if we learned anything in Ohio, I mean, the governor in Ohio and the entire Republican establishment fought really hard to preserve the six-week abortion ban in Ohio, and all of many of you went to work and routed them. I don't know that DeSantis is going to be, you know, DeSantis has got a tough job. I think this thing can pass. Florida is much more historically a libertarian state than a conservative state. And so, you know, we'll see what happens. Um, let me just see a few more questions. I have lots of great questions here um, from all of you. Um, Yeah, lots of suggestions, suggestions. I, let me just tell you that it is my general bias about the guests here, and I'm, I'm gonna, I've been conservative about bringing people on here, is that I'm almost only going to bring politicians on or people who work in campaigns. I'm not, you know, I, I think that that's the world I come from. That's, these are the people I know. And these are people, you know, I think if you recognize and look at the conversations we've had, if you go back and look at the conversation I had with Ruben Gallego or with Gavin Newsom recently, I mean, these are people I've known a long time. And I think the quality of the interaction, the quality of the discussion is so unusual, right? People open up here. They've known me for a long time. And I think where I can do the best for you is to help introduce you to people who are, you know, I my bias here at Hopium is going to be candidates and party committees. It's my bias. I think it's where your biggest bang for your buck financially. It's the biggest bang for your buck in terms of your volunteerism. You know, um, there are lots of amazing organizations doing amazing things. But, you know, as somebody who grew up in the political side, the electoral side of the Democratic Party, I'm a Democrat. You know, I'm a partisan Democrat. And I, you know, I think sometimes we give short shift to supporting politicians and the party itself. I've been really pleased with how excited people have been with Anderson Clayton, for example, and seeing a party leader like that. We'll have Ben Wickler on, you know, I'm going to Wisconsin doing an event with Ben, but I'll also have him on to come do an update on Wisconsin. Ben is a, an exemplary uh, party leader for us. And so I'm more likely to bring those kinds of people on than I am other people in the family, right? That's the, the likelihood. And I, and I am going to try to do more of these kinds of non-live interviews like I did today that are about 15 to 20 minutes long, sort of shorter things to give you windows into things that I think really matter. Um, the live events will continue, but I also am going to be doing more, um, you know, recorded events. Let me, let me close. Um, there's lots of great questions here, but I also think that I've answered a lot of them too, I hope. Um, so let me close with this. Um, so, and some of you have heard me say this, and by the way, I am doing my With Dems presentation tomorrow, um, which at some point, if you haven't watched it in the next month, please take your 30 minutes to watch it. It's really my signature thing. It's the original Hopium flows out of With Dems. With Dems was early Hopium, and Hopium Chronicles is a descendant of With Democrats. Um, 
yeah nay, nay, i'm not going to say your name properly uh but uh yeah anna is amazing if you haven't listened to the interview with anna today it's really incredible anna's an amazing person i just had dinner with her in miami a couple of weeks ago i took a few days off with my family and i saw anna and got an update on the race the interview is also just good it's like a good interview also right it's very fact-based and interesting uh, it's on the site. It was in the email today. Everything's on the site, right? If you miss an email, everything's on the site, hopeyumchronicles.com. Let me close with this. You know, I was, I spoke to a group the other day and and I of old time Democratic uh, political leaders and, and I, and, you know, people who are older than me, I mean, I'm not a kid anymore. And I, um, I said, you know, uh, I, my wife often asked me, you know, when am I going to grow up and get a real job? And I said, at this point in my life, I don't think it's ever going to happen. And, um, but what, why, why are we all here tonight d- doing this compared to all the other things we could be doing in our lives? Why am I working hard six, seven days a week for opium? And it comes down to something that Joe Biden talked about in his State of the Union address, which is FDR's speech in 1941, which he referred to it as the uh, State of the Union of 1941, where FDR started rallying the American people to go fight fascism and authoritarianism. It was the beginning of the campaign to get America engaged in in the European war in World War II. And that speech was also the speech where FDR formulated the four freedoms, um, you know, the freedom of uh, freedom of want, freedom from freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom of worship and freedom of speech and press, right? And these four freedoms um, was, to me, this was the most important political speech ever given in American English because it imagined a world, a very kind of American export to the rest of the world, but it imagined a world that was based on freedom and not dominion and not authoritarianism of control by one people over another. And it was very elegant and powerful, these four freedoms, right? And um, and that those four freedoms then became the basis of the Atlantic Charter that was negotiated by FDR and Churchill in 1941 that became the basis of the alliance that won the war. Those four freedoms then became the basis of the UN Charter in 1945, which created our modern understanding of the, of the world that we all live in today. Those four freedoms became the basis of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights negotiated by Eleanor Roosevelt in 1948, which again articulated this idea that we're building a world on top of these four freedoms. And the world that has come since, since, 19, since 1945, has the, the world of the four freedoms and Pax Americana is a golden age in human history. There's never been a better time to be alive in all of human history than in this period that FDR imagined and that our party has helped create over the last 80 years. We've seen life expectancy go from 45 years to 71 years. We've seen extreme poverty plummet, even though the population of the world has increased dramatically. We've seen more people living under democracies than any time in human history. We've seen literacy rates you know, go through the roof to hit unimaginable levels. More people have had more opportunity during this period to live their dreams than any period in the history of the world. And what's important to realize is that we did that. The Democratic Party did that. We created all that. That's something we did. It's our greatest achievement in, in my view. And what's important now to recognize is that the party that you're part of and this project we're part of here at Hopium, that we're part of the most consequential political force for good in all of human history. There just hasn't been another political entity, not a religious entity, but a political entity that has created, that has had the kind of impact on the world that we've had, the Democratic Party of the United States. And what we all recognize now is that that world that we imagined and built, that golden age for human history is under extraordinary threat right now from Russia and China and Hamas and Hezbollah and Iran and MAGA, right? That that world is under assault. And that we as a party were called once before, FDR, as Joe Biden mentioned, that he called on us and Americans answered the call. And what I'm so proud of is that we're being called again and all of you are answering the call. That we are stepping up, that millions of Americans are going to work every day to preserve their democracy here and democracy all around the world. That we're gonna make sure that this golden age of humankind and these opportunities are there for our kids and our grandkids the way they've been for us. And that this is the fight that we're in. And I can't tell you how proud I am to be in this fight with all of you. 
and to also report to you that we're winning. It may not feel like that every day, but we are. We're winning. And we have to win. We have to win not just for the golden age and this remarkable world, but for our kids and our grandkids. We got to leave it all on the playing field, everybody. I think we're doing that. We still have a lot of work to do. I would much rather be us than them. We need to do more and worry less, all those phrases. But it's just been a great project to be involved with all of you. And our most important work is ahead of us. Thanks, everybody, very much. Have a good night. Keep fighting hard.